fractures of the talus and subtalar dislocations. This is Sankhya Brahman, I'm narrating. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version three. These are authored by David Sanders. Um, I am, again, narrating these slides. So this is gonna cover everything about the, the talus, uh, talar neck fractures, talar body fractures, process fractures, dislocations, etc. So here's the outline. I'm going to cover uh, all these uh, topics. In this particular video, I'm going to focus mostly on assessment of uh, Taylor neck fractures. So it's important to understand the anatomy. Uh, the talus is a bone which is covered in 60% uh, you know, of its surface in cartilage. So it's an unusual bone in that regard. It has no muscular insertions. And uh, the blood supply is important to understand. So. There are um, four primary arterial sources, um, one mainly being the artery of the tarsal canal, uh, and then there's also the artery of the tarsal sinus, and you have uh, dorsal neck vessels and deltoid branches as well. So this kind of shows the distribution um, of the uh, blood supply. So you can see a good portion is um, supplied by the uh, artery of the tarsal canal, and then the artery of the tarsal sinus um, uh, helps supply uh, this inferior um, lateral portion down in here. So the two you're going to hear about a lot, but the deltoid branches and neck vessels also contribute. It's kind of also shown here. All right, so you have the anterior tibial, posterior tibial arteries, and uh, uh, the um, branches coming off, and then the artery of the tarsal canal and sinus uh, shown here, as well as the deltoid artery. So these are infrequent injuries, 2% of all fractures, 6-8% uh, of foot fractures. Unfortunately, they have high complication rates. So osteonecrosis is a real concern. Uh, Post-traumatic arthritis and uh, malunion are also concerns. So mechanisms of injury usually involve some kind of hyperdorsal flexion of the foot on the leg. So very frequently a motor vehicle crash, right, uh, floorboard type injury. Neck of the talus impinges against the anterior distal tibia, causing a neck fracture. And then um, if that continues, then the talar body can dislocate, uh, often posteromedially. So uh, the uh, old term for this is the aviator's astragalus. And uh, nowadays we usually see this from motor vehicle crashes or falls from heights. Um, because of the uh, trauma typically involved, many of these patients also have other traumatic injuries. So uh, you can have a tremendous amount of force uh, shearing across the tail or neck in order to create this. And um, just you have to keep in mind, it's nice to know this ahead of time, but uh, thinking when, or when thinking about how a patient uh, fractured, but when you think about your factor fixation, you have to realize that's the kind of force you want to try to counteract uh, so you can uh, appropriately rehabilitate these patients and have stable fixation. So from an imaging standpoint, these are tough. So it, it, it's, a, it's kind of an unusual shaped three-dimensional structure. Uh, I often recommend, if this is something you really want to sort of better understand, might be a good idea to get your hands on a bone model, uh, even a um, sort of, you can get yourself a little floating model just of the talus alone. You can get a talus and calcaneus to kind of see how they articulate, or get yourself a whole, a whole ankle and foot model, um, which doesn't allow you to see quite you know as well into the joints, but you can at least get a little bit of better appreciation. The anatomy here is a little bit complex. So, Imaging uh, requires multiple plane film orientations. It also requires um, some specialized view. So here's your uh, canal view, uh, shown here, um, and I'll show in the next slide as well, which kind of shows um, your longitudinal alignment of the uh, of the talus and the, the tail or neck, as shown here. Okay, so this helps to identify, especially intraoperative view reduction. Uh, you may also need to get what are called Broden's views, uh, which helps to show the posterior facet. And it's also a, a view you may be familiar with from uh, calcaneal reconstructive surgery. So here's that canal view. Slight ankle plantar flexion with the knee bent to rest the foot on the table, 15 degrees 
of the pronation, right? So you can see the knee and internally rotating, foot pronating, and um, then you get your x-ray view kind of shown in the last slide. CT scans, really helpful. So these are very helpful, especially for surgical planning. It's very important also to make sure your tech knows how to orient these images appropriately or orient your recons. Uh, sagittals, usually they, they know, but in terms of how to orient those axials and coronals might require a little bit of input from you so that it's helpful. Um, kind of like with calcaneus fractures um, for your surgical planning. And I, I think personally 3D reconstructions are also really helpful. Some stuff you're going to see on uh, CT scan that you won't see on x-ray uh, include um, osteochondral uh, debris, impaction, etc. MRI scan, um, not typically used as part of the routine immediate uh, acute imaging, uh, but uh, it can be helpful to uh, demonstrate, for instance, osteonecrosis um, as uh, shown here. Uh, the problem is uh, these are often fractures that have had surgery and implants can make it a little bit difficult to assess. Now, classification is important to understand. Hawkins classification has certainly stood the test of time uh, going back to 1970. Uh, to some degree, it has been shown to be predictive of osteonecrosis or avascular necrosis rate, and it is widely used, so you should certainly be aware of it. So. Hawkins 1 is a non-displaced fracture. Sorry, the uh, slides didn't show up very well here. Um, and that is uh, shown here. So Hawkins 1 is a non-displaced fracture. Uh, actually, don't see a whole lot of these, right? Hawkins 2, as shown here, is your more common injury. Um, the uh, fracture is uh, typically displaced. Um, and it's displaced to a varying degree. A true Hawkins 1 is a true, complete non-displaced fracture, whereas as soon as you have any displacement at all, that's a Hawkins 2. Um, and the more displaced it is, the more um, the Taylor uh, dome is going to potentially sublux or dislocate, and um, the uh, osteonecrosis rate goes up. Hawkins 3, is when you have a subtalar and ankle dislocation. And then a Hawkins 4, which is a pretty rare injury, is um, a uh, dislocation of the entire uh, tailless body, both the uh, head portion and the rest of the body. So um, the osteonecrosis rate goes up okay, as you come across. So the Hawkins 1 is a osteonecrosis rate of uh, 0 to 13 percent, and it's relatively uncommon. Hawkins 2 is uh, 20 to 50 percent, depending on which studies you uh, you read. And this is where, again, any displacement typically leads to subluxation. It's very hard to have the fracture displace and the joint not sublux. And that's the most common type. Hawkins 3 is an extreme injury where uh, you get sort of this extruded tailless body, uh, so-called extruded tailless. And if you have a extruded tailless with it, tail and neck fracture, that's a Hawkins 3, as opposed to a whole body extruded talus, which is another injury, um, commonly referred to as the extruded talus. But nevertheless, these are commonly open fractures, as you can imagine. There's not a lot of room down there. And to get these uh, closed reduced can be very difficult. Osteonecrosis rate, as you expect, is higher, upwards of uh, 80 to 100%. And then the Hawkins 4 is uh, kind of a rare uh, uncommon injury in which you can um, get uh, not only the Hawkins 3, but the Taylor head can dislocate as well, or just sort of an unclassifiable complex injury uh, was added uh, to the classification. So, um, you know, comminution is important as well. Um, it Unfortunately, it's something that can lead to malunion and subtalar joint arthritis. Uh, it's not really something that uh, classification takes quite into account in Hawkins, uh, but uh, in the AOOTA classification, it is included because it's one of the things you take into account when assessing these. So your overall goals of management, and we'll get into this in the next video, are immediate reduction of dislocated joints, 
um, taking into account uh, vascularity, cutaneous tension, and vascular compromises, things that can affect your result, getting anatomic fracture reduction, stable fixation, facilitating union, avoiding complications, kind of your AO principles for the most part um, are uh, certainly at play here. All right, so uh, I'm going to pause here and we'll pick up with the definitive treatment, surgical management, and a little bit about complications um, in the next uh, couple videos and also then get into tailored body and process fractures uh, at the end of this um, uh, group of uh, lectures. Thank you.